Today I'd like to speak to you of the leadings and the drawings of the bridegroom that we see in the Song of Solomon. Now I know when we talk about the Song of Solomon, many people become nervous and uncomfortable, and that's because we're used to viewing it from the standpoint of Solomon the king and his love relationship with the Shulamite bride. But when we look at it from the standpoint of maybe Israel as the bride of God, or we, the church, as the bride of Christ, and we stay consistent along those lines, this story becomes very interesting. And again, it stays completely consistent no matter what level you view it, if you stay and remain upon that level. So today we will look at it again from the standpoint of we, the church, and our relationship with Jesus Christ, our bridegroom. Our first passage is Song of Solomon 1, verse 4, where she says, the bride to the king, lead me or draw me away. But when we get to chapter 2, verses 10 and 13, we hear her declare to us his response to her, where he says, he said to me, rise up, my love, my dove, my fair one, and come away. Now in the Hebrew, it reads something more along these lines, rise up to me and come away. Now, it is this word rise up and this word come away that I want to look at deeper in its Hebrew meaning and Hebrew context. Rise up is the Hebrew word kum, and it means to abide, to remain, to become, to come out of one lifestyle or manner of life into another. It also means to rise up to a place of dignity. Now, it also has a military context, and it would mean in that case, to stand firm, to take your position, to stand your ground. But also this word means to be upheld, to be supported, sustained, and maintained by, which we should be as the bride in Christ Jesus, always supported, always maintained, and always strengthened and upheld by him. The word come away in the Hebrew is the word halak. Now it's very interesting in that it means to approach, to pursue, to walk with or to run with, to accompany. It also means to die in particular to a certain manner of life or lifestyle. And again, in a military context, it would mean to march along with. It also means to continue with and to grow. Now, the drawings and leadings of the bridegroom in the Song of Solomon, I believe, speak to us of sanctification, which is expressed throughout the psalm, but in particular here in chapter 2, verses 10, 13, and 17, and then again in chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Now, I think what we find in a deeper study of these passages and others is that sanctification, beginning with salvation, is our Christian walk. It is not a mere one-time event, rather a continual, lifelong process. One Solomon describes again using terms such as Bether, come away and come down, as he illustrates the drawings and leadings of the bride by the bridegroom. So let's look at this word sanctification, which as we know means holiness, but it expresses the idea of ownership and possession. Sanctification is the surrendering of our will and the rights to our lives to Jesus. Sanctification is a continual process of growth and maturity in one's relationship with Christ. And yet I want to say sanctification is not possible by mere willpower alone, but only by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and His help. Now, the more we separate ourselves from the world's attitudes and opinions, the more like Christ we become. And as our thoughts and attitudes are conformed to those of Christ, so too will our character, our will, and our desires change more and more until we begin to act and to think like Christ. Jesus, as we see from our Song of Solomon example, is continually calling, pursuing, and compelling his church into a new and a deeper level of intimacy, relationship, and maturity. Jesus desires that we move forward and grow and never become stagnant in our relationship and our walk, never becoming satisfied with yesterday's encounter. Let's look closer at the first drawing of Jesus. The first calling, of course, is that to salvation through redemption. It is our being drawn out of darkness. We see this in Song of Solomon chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, and I paraphrase, where she says, Draw me away. 
I am dark but lovely like the tents of Kedar. The king has brought me into his chambers. Now I want you to notice this word draw. We see Jesus use this word in John chapter 6 verses 44 where he says, No man can come unto me unless the Father first draw that person to me. And now that we understand is an open invitation to anyone who so desires to be drawn. But then again in John chapter 12, verse 32, when Jesus spoke concerning his crucifixion, he told the disciples, when I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. The first calling or drawing is to that of salvation. It is to intimate relationship with Christ. It is the offer to abide in Christ. As with the bride in Song of Solomon 1, verses 5 through 13, we are called out of darkness we are sanctified as a member of his flock. In other words, made a sheep of his pasture. Now, I believe most of us can relate our own salvation experience and our own walk with Christ to that of the example we see of the bride in the Song of Solomon. You know, our relationship, it started out with, with excitement and euphoria, but as time goes by, it turns into familiarity and sometimes often indifference. Now, as with the bride in the song in chapter 2, verses 15, as we see her make the statement, catch for us the foxes that spoil the vine, we too experience those foxes, those distractions in life that begin to separate us from the time we once loved to enjoy spending with Christ, day-to-day -day life, family, friends, work, whatever it might be. These things tend to creep in and we tend to spend more time with them and less and less time in the Word and in prayer and with Christ, in our relationship with Christ. As with the bride in the Song of Solomon then, we, like her, begin to cool in our relationship and our excitement for Jesus. Suddenly we find ourselves separated. Solomon uses the term in chapter 2, verses 17, Bether, to describe this sense of separation. Sadly, at this juncture, Many people that were once on fire for Christ simply fade away, not realizing that this sense of separation is actually Jesus trying to draw us further and deeper into intimacy and to, in relationship, growth and maturity with Him. As we experience this sense of separation, we need to take an example from the bride in chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. What we find here is the proper response to this lack or this sense of a lack of his presence. We must be, as the bride at this time, quick to make the necessary responses and the necessary adjustments in our lives. Separated, weary, perhaps even having fallen asleep, nonetheless, this bride still senses the tug of the bridegroom upon her heart. It is through this lost sense of his presence that Jesus, I believe, is actually calling out to his church, to his bride. Once we no longer sense his presence, the bride or we must again awaken and seek him with all of our heart and with all of our soul. I believe Jesus also desires his church to be like this bride in the Song of Solomon, to, for the shadows to flee away, or in other words, maybe to be drawn out of the shadows. Throughout Song of Solomon, we hear the bride continually say, or her desire is that she be drawn out of these shadows for the shadows to flee away and disappear. Now, we, his church, like the bride, should have that same desire. We should have the desire to come out of the shadows. Shadows, as Hebrews 8 verses 1 through 5 and 10, 1 indicate, are images. They are types. They are symbols. They are empty religious practices, but not the real thing. They are not true relationship with Jesus. No longer need we settle for mere shadows, even though they may offer a sense of peace, a sense of refreshment, a sense of security, or even a sense of sanctification, for they are what they are. They are mere substitutes for the real. That which Colossians 2 verses 16 and 17 maintains are without real substance. The lesson from Song of Solomon, I believe, is that there is more than a one-time calling of Jesus. Jesus' leadings, his drawings to we, his bride, to his church, are more than a one-time event. 
It is a continual, lifelong process of leading along a path and a progression, a journey, if you will, of encounters between we, his bride, and Jesus, our King. In past church history, just as today, I believe we are seeing this played out. We are seeing people drawn out of the shadows. We are seeing people awakened. We are seeing the church and the bride and people in the world rise up and we see awakening and revival taking place. The desire to be led or to be drawn away, I believe, sums up the principle of the dispensation of grace or what we might call the church age, indicating that sanctification is one's willingness and one's desire to separate to devote themselves wholly and completely to Jesus, the choice to submit, to surrender, to obey, and to follow him no matter what the cost. As he calls and leads with his gentle, loving voice, Jesus reveals how precious we are to him and how he longs for relationship, for communion, and for intimacy between himself and his bride. He longs to give his church the peace they so greatly desire. He longs to give his church that which they so greatly need. He leads by peace. He guides by peace. And no matter what the circumstance or situation, no matter what the trials and troubles are that you might face, as we read in places like Isaiah chapter 55 verse 12, Jesus has made his peace available. The peace that we access as we continually make those steps and decisions of sanctification.